So I'd like to ask first, uh, are you familiar with the term alibi? Who, who knows what alibi is or have heard of that before? I will try to, to explain just a little bit. Uh, alibi is about being able to take part in playing. And uh, when we make a LARP, we usually we have alibi just because we say this is a LARP and then it's okay for me to, to pretend to be Napoleon. But if I start just pretending to be Napoleon out on the street, then people will think that there's something wrong with me. But the alibi is also about what enables us, such as the social mechanisms. If the others are playing too, then it's easier for you to play. Maybe if you put on a costume or a nice hat, then it's easier for you to play than if you are just yourself in plain clothes. And today I will talk about some of the difficulties with creating alibi to play in uh, the shadow of oppression. Um, <coughs> I think I'd just like to do a little survey first about this thing with oppression. H who has been to, um, to a country where the population is oppressed? To and then I think, I mean, of course, some people, we, we could say that people are oppressed everywhere. People are oppressed in Sweden and in Norway too by social mechanisms and norms and all this. But when, I, when I'm talking about oppression in this sense, I'm generally talking about authoritarian governments where you can be arrested for criticizing the government or where you, you are not free to, to exercise quite basic human and political rights. I will talk mostly about uh, three countries today. That's uh, Belarus and Lebanon and Palestine. Uh, are any of you have been to, to Belarus or to Palestine? One, and, uh, and to Lebanon? No, no, then, uh, that's good. Then I can say whatever I want and you, <laughs> you can't uh, arrest me on it. Um, you might know that uh, that uh, Fantasy for Brunei is a Norwegian NGO that has been uh, adventuring a bit with LARPing in these countries for the past uh, five years. And today I'll tell you the stories about how this, uh, this started. And all of this, uh, it started in, uh, in Belarus. And I've called the first part playing on a We used to say that Belarus was the last dictatorship in Europe. It's not really true anymore. They have some stern competition from Russia, from Hungary, and other countries coming too, so it's getting worse. Uh, but this guy, Alexander Lukashenko, he has been uh, the president since Belarus became independent of the Soviet Union. And if you disagree with him on issues such as uh, freedom of expression or human rights, then you might just find that uh, you lose your job or you lose your right to study at the university or maybe if you're a young male you will be sent off to some draconian military service in the faraway woods in Belarus and of course this is not because you criticize the government this is always something that happens because you didn't have the right stamp on your paper so you were a little bit too late too many times so you, you never get the, the, the true explanation maybe you forgot to declare your property in the correct way during the last tax return so there's always some Kafka's uh, Kafka's uh, reason for what they do uh, however they they are not so much into concealing that so when the Soviet Union collapsed and Russia renamed KGB into FSB Belarus just kept it so in Belarus they still have the KGB and the whole country is a little bit of a museum from uh, from the Soviet times but uh, that's enough on the state of Belarus I'll try to get back to, to LARPing and what we have done there. We worked together with an organization called Education Center Post, and they came to Knutepunkt in 2007 to see if LARP was something they could use in, in their work. And uh, most of the response from the, the Knutepunkt crowd first was, how can we conceal political messages in LARPs? How can we make uh, subtle allegories such as making Lukashenko's guys the orcs and the opposition the elves or, or these kind of approaches. But the Belarusians, they weren't so impressed by this. Uh, they said they had enough orc larps in the country uh, already and that so I, I made it say Lukashenko like an orc. They, they didn't want to do that. What they did uh, say was that we, we need to make an alibi to make people dare to play. Because when you are you are in an authoritarian country. You don't just need a normal social alibi to play. You also need an alibi in the more conventional use of the word that it's not a crime what you're doing. 
So the solution, the first thing we did there was to make a World War II LARP with a clear educational profile. And the Belarusian authorities, they are very much fond of World War II uh, when they can uh, romanticize over how the Red Army defeated the evil Nazis. And, and this is, uh, there are a lot of reenactments groups in, in Belarus and th this is a very popular uh, subject. So 1943 was uh, this LARP and it was run two times. And uh, they are not joking, the Belarusians, when they make historical LARPs. I think this is the hardest LARP I have ever played physically. Uh, it was partly because the airline lost my luggage, so I had no winter clothes in the in the Belarusian forests in the middle of the winter. But it was uh, it was also because, like what you see here, that's the Nazi food, and they do it quite properly. Uh, however, I was with the Polish partisans, and what we got was some cold lard, a uh, speck, and some buckwheat. And uh, if you wanted to have chicken, you could slaughter one of them yourself. Nobody did it, so they didn't know really what to do with them at the end of the LARP. Um, it was a very authentic LARP. The soldiers, they had um, they had um, real uniform and weapon uh, replicas. Again, this is something that strengthens the alibi to play. And it strengthens the alibi especially for uh, academics, historians, uh, university people. There was just one drawback with these Nazi uniforms, and that was that the organizers, they had forgotten that there were families coming to pick mushrooms in the forest uh, in the weekends. And they got quite scared when they met these people with, uh, with guns and, and uh, everything. So at the noon on Saturday, there arrived a car looking like this, and it's virtually full of policemen. So it's not like uh, you would have in Sweden or Norway with two or three policemen in the front, but here is I think it's 12 seats and there is one policeman in all of them. So when this arrives, and there are also one KGB officer, and all of these people are coming out on the LARP and, um, and they wonder what is happening. And then one of the organizers, she is playing a pregnant woman, so she has a pillow under her, uh, under her uh, shirt. and walks up to them and she pretends to actually be pregnant, which gives some extra authority. And uh, they, th when they learn that the, the Nazi, the people playing Nazis, they are reenactors that have this uh, kind of registration or permission to do historical reenactments, we, we are actually managing to get left with a warning. Uh, but I think uh, I'm really glad I didn't find out that we were foreigners there, uh, because then I think um, we might have had worse difficulties than the cold uh, winters in, in, um, in Belarus. But let's get back to why did we do all this? What is this really about? It is about oppression of civilian population. It is about nuancing uh, the views that the Red Army was only good guys and the Nazis were only bad guys. It is about raising the awareness of the Polish partisans this is a phenomenon that's almost written out of Belarusian history. If you go to normal Belarusian history class, usually people will not talk about these people, even though they played a very important role in the war. And it's perhaps most of all about raising awareness that even in times of war, humans are still humans, even the Nazis. And how does society respond when we break the norms? I have to admit that lately we haven't been so successful in evading the radar of the Belarusian authorities. Um, me and several of my co-workers in Fantasy Femina, we are no longer allowed into the country. Uh, but we are continuing many activities in Lithuania. And there is a growing scene in Minsk that are doing very interesting things. For example, a lot that's called Have You Come Here to Play Jesus, have been played at several Nordic events. It's about uh, euthanasia or mercy killing. And um, what we took with us from the first years in Belarus is that when you have political impression, uh, uh, suppression, you need stronger alibis than you, you need in, um, in other kinds of uh, uh, contexts. You don't only need to overcome the social norms, you also need to overcome the fear of sanction from, uh, from police at the same time as you actually manage to attract the audience you want. So this, uh, 
this took us uh, to the next uh, adventure with the, with the experience from Belarus under uh, our belt. The, the next uh, international adventure again came at Knutepunkt. And uh, we had some discussions with some Israelis that came to Denmark. Uh, and um, we, 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 we started thinking about this, maybe we can do something uh, with Palestine test out the ability to play under occupation, which is a completely different kind of oppression than it is to play under an authoritarian uh, domestic regime. This is uh, a map of Israel and Palestine. I will not go very much into details on this, but I'll just say very quickly that on the West Bank, uh, which is uh, this area, this is the land loss, like uh, land that was controlled by Palestinians in uh, before 1945 and the UN partition plan, and then uh, this is what is called area C and B and A, and area A is the green, which is what is controlled by Palestinian authorities today. But I'll not go so much into that. Uh, anyway, in, in the West Bank there are very severe limits to the civil rights of the Palestinian population. It includes lack of safety from arbitrary arrests. It includes the, the separation barrier or the wall that is severely restricting the freedom of movement. And uh, I will not even go into Gaza because we have been working with um, the, the West Bank. Anyway, shortly after Knutepunkt, uh, there started spreading rumors that someone was planning a law project in Palestine. And quickly the rumors was that someone are doing a LARP about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict which is quite inflammable material. So here is one reaction from one of the Israeli lawpers at, uh, at Knut, uh, at Inshul, um, I think it's at the, the Norwegian uh, law forum live.org shortly after uh, Knut Punkt. And here is making a quiz for us with a lot of questions such as uh, what possessed Israel to suddenly invade the areas of the West Bank and Gaza in 1967? How many Palestinians received medical treatment in Israeli hospitals in 2002, in 2004, in 2008? How many Palestinians were refused treatment or delayed? How come Israeli forces did not stop Hamas from taking over Gaza in 2006, etc.? So a lot of questions that we apparently need to, to be able to answer if we are doing something there. And then uh, once again, the LARPers, uh, in the end, we... We, we think we are quite creative, but I think we often go back to the same track. So, of course, it would be easy to turn this into an orcs, awesome Israeli versus elves, awesome Palestinian things with ease. Uh, and our intention was it was never to open the can of worms by, by making an allegorical lap about the conflict. It was actually done later by the Finns, but we wanted to build on what we have learned in, in Belarus, uh, which in a, a turn would appear to be quite useless knowledge for Palestine, uh, which I'll tell you more about. But we, uh, we at least we decided that um, we, we wanted to do something and we wanted to, s to just try to build up a community. So I went to Faris and he was the chairperson of an NGO called Peace and Freedom Forum. And I, I, he greeted me in this uh, fort, uh, four-story building outside Ramallah in his office where he was sitting in chain smoking all the time. And I brought uh, this uh, book, Nordic Lop. I had met Faris a few years earlier at a conference in Norway, and we had played a little Lop there, but that was his only experience with it. So I showed him the, the book and the greatness of the Nordic Lop and uh, asked if he was ready for some cultural imperialism from, uh, from us. Uh, and I, I quickly moved into the territory of how useful this can be for training and for educational purposes, uh, how you can use this to build organizations. And then uh, Faris, he puts away his cigarettes and, and straightens uh, up in the chair and says, Martin, you, you need to, to understand. If you want a political discussion, I have a debate group for that. If you want to learn a history, I have a history group for that. If you want to talk about the occupation, I have an advocacy group for that. But Martin, we need to live here. We need to play more. We need to use our creativity. We are here every day, whether we like it or not. And we need to be people with our own identities. We can't just be the people who are occupied. So let's just play and see if the Palestinians like your way of playing. And I was thinking this was really beautiful words, that they were they, what they wanted was not all their advocacy and the political stuff, they just wanted to play. 
But uh, at the same time, it was very terrifying because it meant that they had a completely different approach than the Belarusians had. And I think this is about how differently oppression can work. In, in one country, it, it strangles the free thought, while in another, the thought is free, but like the spirit is caged. Anyway, we, we gathered a group of people and uh, we organized a play day. So there came um, a group of, uh, um, to a house in Birsait, outside Ramallah. It was uh, seven, seven men and, uh, and two women who showed up. I was a bit disappointed by this gender balance and also by the number of people who came. But I learned later that at the drama school in Birsait or Ramallah, I don't remember, a local drama school, they had Every year they took in the same number of male and female students and 100% of the female students dropped out before they finished their education. So the, the alibi to play for girls in Palestine is not very strong. It's something that even for boys may be frowned upon but even more for girls. And um, I, I learned that we should be quite happy with these two girls they managed to bring. Now they have a community that's quite balanced. They have been doing a, a great job with that. But who were these people and what did they want to play? And what kind of alibi did they need? So we started out with some, uh, some icebreakers and uh, then we started playing the family Anderson. I don't know, have any of you played it? It's a Swedish LARP, yeah, one? Ah. It's a very nice little game, takes only two hours, made by uh, Johan Rutlander and Åke Nolimo. It's about a family that's having a quarrel about how to distribute the heritage from, from the parents. And what's very nice with this is that you pair up two and two players and they play a tag team so they can go in and out and, and you share the same character. And we paired up the Norwegians and the Palestinians so that we were two people sharing a character and, and thought that this was a nice way of doing some team building. And uh, the love went on and there was we had the discussions, uh, but the, the enthusiasm wasn't really there and the energy wasn't really there. And then at one point, just by accident, there were only all the five characters were played by Palestinians at the same time. <coughs> and we asked them, can you, can you change to, to Arabic? And it was, quite, uh, it was quite amazing to see how the statues started to animate, how the body language changed and how they, I think the picture here is from, from the family Anderson. Once they were able to, to speak Arabic only, all this became so much more, more fluent and they were agitating like only Arabs can agitate, uh, which can be quite loud and, and, uh, and enthusiastic. So when, when we discovered this, we, we were quite happy and we were thinking, okay, let's just uh, go on playing with, with only the Palestinians there and let them play in Arabic. So we went on to play, oh, to play uh, the tribunal. I have, are any of you familiar with the tribunal? No, it's a LARP uh, about some soldiers in a war somewhere at some time. And somebody have stolen food, and most of them think it's one of the officers, but they are afraid to, to say this to the tribunal who is trying to find out. So it's kind of a prisoner dilemma. Should I, should I cheat and tell it was my friend, or should I try to protect my friend and then risk punishment myself? It was the winner of the LARP Writer Challenge, which was about making LARPs for this kind of society discussions. And uh, we re-ran uh, re the, the workshop. In this, in this game, it's also the characters have names after animals, such as uh, horse or mouse. Or and we, we took out pig and dog because we were afraid that maybe since they are Muslims, they wouldn't like to play these unclean animals, so we just changed it into some other animals. And then um, they started playing, and we said, please play in Arabic so we could flow more and more easily, and uh, it seemed to work. They played, and we didn't really see the big energy, but they were obviously discussing. And we, we thought, okay, we, we nailed this. It's about language. That's what they need, and then they have enough alibi to play. And then after 20 minutes, uh, everything falls silent and they stop talking. And we sit in, an, in the room next to them. What is, what is going on here? Why are everyone silent? And first we think maybe it's something they are playing on. And then after five minutes, we, we go in and we're, why are you all silent? And then 
uh, we, s we solved it. Uh, what? You solved it? You are, you are not supposed to solve it. You are supposed to, to play the character. Morons, what's this? Uh, and and we, we, we discovered that this was something we took for granted, that we have a playing culture, that we, we try to create drama and intrigues, not to just solve the problem. And um, we, we discovered that this was, of course, something we couldn't just take for granted. That's something that we have developed in our scene and, and something that's not necessarily like that everywhere else. So the last thing we wanted to do with them was to create their own LARP together with them. And then we used When Our Destinies Meet. Have you played uh, When Our Destinies Meet? I'm uh, two, three people. I'm surprised that uh, I thought everyone had played all these LARPs. But maybe it was because before everyone had played these LARPs and then nobody wanted to run them anymore because they thought everyone had played them. So maybe we should start running them again. Uh, this is a framework where Everything you know is that there will be a party, and then you have very, very simple characters on one word, such as you are the boss, or the father, or the secret blind date, and then you develop the rest uh, in a workshop. And we, we, we would only do the workshop, because we didn't uh, have so much time, but we wanted to try out this to give them ownership over creating something. So we started, what kind of party is this? Uh, it's uh, the circumcision party of someone, okay? Circumcision is umskjæring på norsk. Yeah. And okay, yeah. And uh, who's circumcision party? Uh, it's the circumcision party of uh, Dr. Durex, who owns a condom factory. Okay. Um, and not only would the president of Palestine be there, there would also be CIA agents, secret lovers, anti condom terrorists. <laughs> there will be, will be alcohol served and pigs meat, and there would be sex workers coming to the party. And, and where did all this come from? And, and what sh wha how should we handle this? We, we just had the feeling, we now we are doing something right, now we are having a flow, and then they are, they are what are they doing? They are creating a monster of taboos. Uh, and will they, will they ever LARP again? Will they think this is just about being silly, or what is it? Maybe they were just tired. So, but anyway, we, we couldn't do anything else than going ahead with this. And at the end, uh, we, we thanked them for, for taking part, and for being here for the long whole day, very hot day in the summer. And uh, we remind them, yeah, take with you the tools from the workshops, and even though this was maybe a little bit silly, it can work in other ways. And uh, we, yeah. A and then the, they respond, what? Are we not going to play this? What is this? Uh, of course we have to play this. And I think at that moment we had just witnessed the birth of LARP in the Arab world, which is, uh, by the way, the title of a book coming out uh, these days. So we were very, very happy, and, and of course we, we, we wanted to play this, and we did it, and it was quite fun. And I think it was quite clear for us at this moment that LARP was just the right tool to probe into some questions that can be hard to talk about. Uh, things that are taboo, things that you usually don't talk about, but you maybe think about. And we were able to push... Uh, the boundaries a bit, and we decided that we should stop writing pigs and dogs and alcohol all out of the manuscripts and rather and rather push a little bit for those themes. So this led up to the project called Till Death Do Us Part. And uh, Till Death Do Us Part is a LARP about a Norwegian man marrying a Palestinian woman. It's a contemporary LARP set in Palestine, and it's inevitable to, to touch upon the occupation that's looming in the background. But the LARP was mainly about other controversial things, such as a marriage between a Palestinian and a foreigner. That is quite controversial in Palestine, even in liberal circles, and in particular when the woman is the Palestinian. It's about uh, conflict between old tradition and, and modern way of life in Palestine. Uh, for example, we had, uh, we had a gay character in one of the families, in, in the groom, the groom's sister was uh, a lesbian. And uh, what kind of reactions would this give? What would they think about that? We were quite worried about putting the subject into the LARP because the way gays are treated in Palestine is not very nice always, and even quite liberal people can be quite homophobic. But the, the participants, they really embraced this, and they, they dove into the characters and, and filled the characters with prejudice and played them really, really well and asked for more uh, afterwards. 
and we last year we had a, a two girls coming to Grand Slan festival in Norway. They put up a LARP called Kill in the Name of Honor. It's a LARP about honor killings in Palestine. Uh, in 2013, there were 26 young women killed by their families in Palestine. And uh, here is one of the creators of that LARP, and they ran it in Palestine. They were interviewed by, by local TV in Ramallah about this. So I think, uh, of course, press coverage is nice, but it is quite an achievement uh, that we have been able to provide a tool that can empower people to talk about uh, taboos and overcome social repression to, to talk about this. I don't know if you have played, uh, heard about Screwing the Crew. That's uh, a LARP that's about open relationships. And this was also one of the next LARPs they played, which uh, is uh, something Mohammed said. Uh, it was very interesting to see, but uh, I don't think it's something for us in Palestine. Uh, anyway, uh, the Palestine community is uh, very active. They are making LARPs uh, in Palestine and in, in several of the neighboring countries. They also have projects uh, with the Syrians and people in Jordan, Egypt. So they are doing a lot of interesting stuff and also doing stuff in, uh, with Scandinavians. And if you want to work with them, I think they are very open to suggestions. But the pressure we found in Palestine was not so much compared to what we we're going to find in the refugee camps in Lebanon. So this was level three and the last part of my talk. We were asked by a member of the Palestine Committee in Norway, why are you working so much in the West Bank? All the Westerners are there, all the NGOs are there. Why aren't you doing anything for the, for the refugees in Lebanon instead? Nobody cares about them. You should do something about the, the children there instead. And uh, personally, I had ex absolutely no experience with children lobs. Um, but uh, we, we, we decided this was quite a challenge and we wanted to do it. Are any of you have been to a refugee camp ever? No? Yeah, one? Where have you been? The camps we've been working with, they are older and have been there for quite uh, a while. It's, um, it's a bit of a, of a pressure cooker in the, in the camps in, uh, in Lebanon. And it wor looks a little bit like this. So it's a kind of a, um, it's kind of a mix between a city and a, and a prison, maybe. Um, A camp like this is under constant threat from Israeli air raids, from Lebanese forces and other armed Lebanese groups, Hezbollah. It's constant rivalry between Fatah and Hamas. But most of all, there is so little space. And there is constant noise. You can hardly hear your own thoughts. There's always somebody to, to hear you, to see you, and to judge you. And even compared to the threat of, of war, I think that the lack of peace of mind is perhaps what is the most difficult condition for keeping the, uh, the uh, ability to play. Social codes dictating every aspect of life. Before we left Norway, we, we asked some people who had lived in this camp. It's Russia Dia, by the way, it's South Lebanon. What do what do the kids uh, play with in uh, in Russia? The yeah. war, okay, uh, and uh, only war. They throw stones at each other and fight with sticks. So okay, um, <laughs> and it it wasn't that bad as it sounded when when we arrived, but we at least uh, we figured out that the, the opportunities for doing things is quite uh, limited in in a camp, and um, with all the war playing and all the war looming in the background all the time, we decided we, we wanted to, to do something that uh, was not about war. So when children lobs in the Scandinavian countries is often about uh, fighting with swords, we decided that we wanted to, to avoid that. What do people do then? So 
the girls they stay at home and help their mothers and and the boys they hang around in the narrow streets and sometimes they play war or sometimes they take their gun and go shooting a bo bird and barbecue it or but it's it's really quite limited and it's very very cramped but there are heroes uh, everywhere our partner is was an organization called Al Jalil and their main tool was uh, to never challenge any norms and that might sound maybe a little bit uh, passive, but I think it was the only way for them to to manage to achieve anything. They had a very good reputation that they had built up over, over many years, and they made activities for kids such as football, basketball, traditional dancing, and it was even okay for the girls to join many of these activities because they knew that Al Jalil would not challenge any norms. They were, they it was safe. They will just play basketball, and it will be done in a, in a decent way. With uh, the, the adult population having very much pressure on them, it's also hard for them to, to play. But we decided we needed to start with the adults. So we had 15 volunteers from Al Jalil joining us to uh, help us make labs for children. And we first needed to create alibi for them to play. So we had in mind that the people we met in the West Bank, they really loved this, that the, the LARPs, it gives an alibi for girls and boys to play together and they can even touch and they can do silly things together in a way that might not be possible uh, in all other contexts. So we tried uh, a little bit of the same, some physical workshops, and then we overstepped the line on the first day we were there. So. We were doing an exercise, and one girl said, I'm opting out of this, I don't want to do this, because some holding hands or touching or something. And then the next one, I'm also opting out, and then it's just like domino going down, all the girls opting out and saying, I don't want to do this, because otherwise you would be less decent than the rest. And we lost some of the volunteers due to this, so it was a big mistake from our side. Uh, but. Uh, we also got them to, to accept that what we're doing uh, was not with intent and we put people nice and tidy back on the line <laughs> with no touching. Um, and what we also found out was that this wasn't just about that touching was forbidden, it was also about that the alibi was too weak. So it was just a theater exercise, it wasn't enough to allow for touching. But the second step went uh, much better. We played LARPs, and then more touching was allowed. Here I am getting uh, touched a lot, at least. Um, we played, uh, again, the family Anderson and When Our Destinies Meet. And when we started LARPing, it was amazing to see how much stronger the alibi was, how much more people dared to do than when you just played around with a theater exercise, because then it was like you had a, a real purpose. So. When we had warmed up the people, we started preparing for the LARP. And uh, the LARP was about uh, tribes that were harassed by a monster. And the only way to, to send uh, the, the monster away was to defeat it with water balloons. Then it could go back to sleep. No killing. <laughs> Uh, so uh, they had to solve various tasks, going to various people and, and help them with uh, with stuff. And uh, this lab was prearranged by us, so it was just to showcase what could be done. And the monster approached, and they had uh, th this was all made by by garbage that we found laying around because we we didn't want to make LARP into an expensive activity. So I think we spent five euros or something on everything for this LARP. And when the monster arrived, they defeated it with uh, water balloons. And but some people were a little bit eager defeating it, but we, we managed to save uh, the guy inside the monster after a while. <laughs> uh, and um, the, the, the it was very successful. The, the children loved it. So then we had showcased a children's LARP. And the second step was, of course, to have the participants make their own LARP. And we, we had only six or seven uh, volunteers left, but on the other hand, that was the people who were really committed and wanted to do this. So they decided uh, to make a LARP about a wolf, a very dangerous wolf, budget 10 euro. And we coached uh, these volunteers for three days and made, uh, made
made uh, characters and uh, and props. This is uh, chicken hats, uh, costumes. And then it was uh, the big day, and the uh, lap was finished, and we had invited children from all over the camp to to come at two o'clock to play. And then at two o'clock we had uh, one participant. So this was uh, very oh shit. What are we doing now? <laughs> we have been working with these guys for three days, and we have one participant to play lap. This is no good. And uh, we we talked to Al Jalil, and they called the football team and the basket team and the dancing team and and different kind of groups they had, and and a few people arrived. And at around al an hour after we were supposed to start, we had uh, I think 20 kids, and we decided, okay, it's enough. We can play with 20 kids. So we walked down to the beach where the lap was uh, supposed to take place, and then just like if we were the pipers of Hamelin, then there came children out from everywhere and, and joined us more and more. And I think by the time we came down to the beach, we had 100 kids uh, that had joined <laughs> us on the way. And we, we hardly had enough props for all these kids. And uh, especially we had, um, we had the, the football boys. They wanted to play uh, wolf cubs. So the wolf, he was supposed to have only three cubs, but I think he ended up with 10 or 12 cubs because that was what the cool boys wanted to do. And uh, this was uh, it's quite a dramatic lap. This is the wolf. He's played by Hussein, who is uh, the leader of the organization we collaborated with, a very respected man in the community. Uh, and um, he, um, the wolf, he came every day to steal one of the sheep or the sh chickens that lived in the village. And um, this was uh, this was of course not good. What what do we do with this? The every day he's coming and, and eating our children or, or, or chickens and sheep. Um, and uh, and they had to come up with a plan. And uh, the plan was to put out uh, one uh, chicken as bait inside a cage, <laughs> and then uh, next time the wolf was coming, he was uh, trapped in the cage. So what do we do now? We have we have uh, we have trapped uh, the wolf. What do we do with him? And we need to to discuss this. And I don't know. Uh, I d think I know what would be the solution in a Danish children lab. I don't know with uh, with Sweden. Uh, but I was very very happy when they decided that uh, they would not kill the wolf. They will uh, just send the wolf to exile into the mountains. So the wolf had to promise to to leave the village and uh, never come back. Um, and uh, everyone were really happy about this. So we, we walked uh, back to the village or to the, to the refugee camp after the LARP. Uh, and everyone walks like this. They are super happy, super enthusiastic, still wearing their costumes. The LARP is over. And I remember one woman came there with her child. She was holding in front of their eyes, like, you're not supposed to see these crazy people. They, th there's something wrong with them. But the the atmosphere had changed so much, and the volunteers were so proud. They had uh, made this for the children themselves, and and they had uh, they had succeeded. So we we celebrated uh, with uh, diplomas, and we had uh, we had pizza from the king of pizza. It was the only pizza outlet in the refugee camp. I had a very wonderful receipt from him where it says uh, to Mr. Martin has paid this much for uh, ten pizzas or something. And then he signs the king of pizza. It's just written on an envelope or something. <laughs> but anyway, what, what, have we, what have we learned from this? We have played under oppression in Belarus, in Palestine, in Lebanon. In Belarus, we, we, we tried to play under power abuse. And we tried to, to focus on what is the human's worth. We used alibis of education and, and historical reenactment. In Palestine, we, we didn't play about prisons or occupation or terrorists. We played about condoms and gays and, and, uh, and uh, open relationships, and just as simple as under the alibi of character. And, and in Lebanon and in the camps, we played with the freedom to be crazy, using mainly the alibi of the opinion leaders, of people like Hussein, who can be a wolf, then can everyone be a wolf. But his alibi was the foreigners. We are here to play with you, which I think is one of the reasons they are still struggling a bit, because they don't have us uh, all the time there. And not because they need our knowledge, but they need the alibi we provide. Okay, I do this because the stupid foreigners are here. So 
but still, all the alibis are created by roleplay, and it shows that it's uh, when, when if we want to talk about something we don't normally talk about, we need to do something we don't normally do. And it, it is possible to to overcome social pressure, and it is possible to to overcome uh, political pressure. And I am I'm, I'm actually amazed by how much uh, how much. The, the role playing can provide an environment where you, where you are able to do these things or to talk about things that you don't usually talk about. Do you have a question? Thanks. Um, I was thinking when you explained that um, they sort of need the alibi of you being present to be more comfortable playing. Um, how did you perceive your status when coming to this group? Were you sort of cool and knowledgeable because you came from abroad, or were you this funny, silly guy that was playing games? And and since you're there, it's it's like because I can imagine both that you're you're silly because you don't understand their questions, but you're cool because you're coming from that side. And I think it is like that. Both it is both. Maybe. That uh, it is. You are silly and cool at the same time. <laughs> And I think it's in the same way, it's a little bit it's the same thing you do if you do an educational LARP and you go into a classroom in Sweden and the kids are like, the way you have to do this. Or if you if you are playing a LARP with some corporate suits, it's also the same. Why do why are we doing this? So you need to be silly and cool at the same time to to at least get the alibi started. But then I hope that it can run more on its own after a while. Um yeah, so just to conclude, I think the alibi to play, it doesn't die under oppression, it's but it sometimes falls asleep. And I I want to end uh, all of this with a quote from Najat, which was one of our main uh, partners in, in Lebanon. And she said that at the end of the day, we don't stop playing because uh, we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing. And it's not her quote originally, but I think it's uh, very beautiful words. Uh, and it's worth taking with us. So... That's it, and thanks a lot for listening. <laughs> you have more questions? No. I think I can just mention for you that there is a festival in Minsk. For those of you who'd like to join a LARP festival in Belarus, uh, they very much want foreign people to go there and uh, it's not so difficult for you to get a visa, and it's not so expensive. So I think it's in May. If you want to go, Google LARP, Minsk LARP Festival, and then you can see the Soviet Union Museum of Minsk and experience cutting-edge uh, cutting <laughs> chamber LARPs at the same time. And uh, there is probably more stuff going to happen in Palestine as well, but I don't have anything right now.